Hello, brothers and sisters of Christ. You're looking at me going, wow, you're trying to dress up for, for, for winter time. Isn't it summer? Well, I think I've told you, brothers and sisters of Christ, before, I open the windows at night for um, my AC. I get the house as cold as possible, and then you close all the windows in the morning, and then it heats up in the day. We can get to 100 degrees outside, and it'll stay cool inside the house, clear up until around 5 in the evening, 4 to 5 in the evening. Well, we had a cold front come in, and uh, they probably call it fog, but I call it the clouds. I got to go walk with Declan in the clouds because the cloud level started raising and coming up the mountainside, and it was just foggy. You couldn't see about a block away, and that's about it. Some of the trees down this hillside just up and disappeared. A lot of the trees did. In other words, it got very cold last night. Temperature dropped, so I woke up this morning to a cold house, and it's cold outside. So that's why I've got the hat on and everything. But let's get to this study because it's going to be a long one and I probably won't be opening this. We, we will be using scripture, don't, be, don't get me wrong, but I probably won't be turning to each scripture because I kept putting stuff in here, kept putting stuff, and there's still verses I left out because like it started getting longer and longer and longer. So, Brothers of Christ, make sure you, you remember you can pause the video and you can turn. Okay? There's this big thing right now, that a lot of the... Um, Organized religions, false religions that follow false gospels, uh, basically servants of Satan. We call them servants of Satan because the Bible says, You are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a liar from the beginning and the father of it. False gospels, false doctrines, doctrines of devils. A man that's a heretic after the first and second admission reject. All this stuff, they don't want judgment. They don't want to once you're judging them, whether they're preaching the truth, teaching the truth, uh, living the truth, whether they are truly saved and born again. Okay. Now, we did a study on are you a Christian in Christ. I, should, I really highly would recommend watching that video. Okay. Because the first person, as we go through this, remember, judgment must first begin at the house of God. Right here, this is the first person I judge. This man right here. All my studies, this study that I'm going through today, I've judged myself many times. Okay, You judge yourself first. Then you judge the brethren. Lastly, you judge the world. Okay, Judgment must first begin at the house of God, and if it first must begin at us, what shall be then that obey, what shall be of them that obey not the gospel? I'm kind of butchering a little bit, forgive me, but... Then they obey not the gospel, the lost world. Okay, and I don't want to get ahead of myself because we got verses in here to go through. But the one thing that this lost, false converts, wolves in sheep's clothing, servants of Satan, people who don't want to come to God on His terms, the number one thing they hate is judgment. Judgment, judgment, judgment. They hate it. Okay, here we'll be uh, talking about: Are we to prove ourselves? And the people around, and the people around out that around us that profess to be in Christ, are we to judge? Are we to prove ourselves and prove those who claim that they're one of us? They're one of us. This but this Bible study started with me going, hmm. I've gone through the Pauline epistles a lot of times, and how many times? I'm curious. How many times does Paul tell the brethren that if they prove themselves, to prove it, to use the word prove? Then we got into the word tried. And I didn't find the word tested. Okay, I put it in the title because that's what I, I, I did this Bible study. We're looking for all three words. Proved, tried, and tested. Okay. Now, this will probably be a whole other study, but I believe God's the one who tries people. That's the same thing as testing. They're, he's trying them to see if they'll be faithful. God does that. We're not supposed to do that. But we are supposed to prove ourselves, and we're supposed to make other people prove themselves. We're going to get into that in this study. Um, now, I have shown you what it means to be in Christ. Remember we talked about that? If to be in Christ Jesus, the Bible definition in Christ Jesus is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, wisdom. The beginning of wisdom is fearing God. The middle, I never talked about the middle of wisdom, but the middle, <laughs> the middle of wisdom, Declan is sitting right next to me, he kind of moaned there for a second. Yes, we're talking about the Word of God, deal with it. The middle, the middle of wisdom is seeking the Lord. Remember, seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. Is seeking the Lord's Word, seeking His way. What's the end of wisdom? 
once you found God's way, once you found God's word, buy the truth and sell it not. Once you found the truth, you hide it in your heart and you live it. The word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So the beginning of wisdom is fearing God. The middle of wisdom is seeking God's way, God's word, God's commands. The end of wisdom is keeping it. Taking the truth that you found that God shows you, hides it in your heart and you live it. Righteousness, being an ambassador for Jesus Christ and being a, a living witness and a verbal witness. The ministry of reconciliation, we talked about that. Uh, sanctification, you're supposed to be separate from this world. You are supposed to be clean as this world is dirty. We're supposed to be clean. We're supposed to be set apart. And as we go through this, you've got brethren that, that are falling away. You've got false converts that come in and bring in the dirty and filthiness of the world into the body of Christ and says, I'm one of you. Uh, we're supposed to be sanctified. We're supposed to be holy. We're supposed to conform to His image. We're supposed to be doing things God's way. We're to conform to Him. One of the things God's really put on my heart lately, brothers and Christ, is that saying that God is the potter and we're the clay. You've got men coming in saying, no, I'm the potter. This is the clay. God is the clay, this is the clay, and I'm the potter. And God's got to conform to me, and I can make His Word conform to me. Remember what the Bible says? Men who handle the Word of God deceitfully, they wrestle the Scriptures to their own destruction. Why? Because they're trying to make this conform to what this guy right here wants. And I know I've been accused of doing that from time to time. We're going to get into this. Okay? There's times I have failed. And we're going to be doing a whole other study on that. Indoctrination. Okay, indoctrinated to make this conform to you. We've all been indoctrinated with that. That'll be a whole other study. Now I've shown you what it means to be in Christ. And the last part was uh, redemption. And that's the motivator to, to do the first three. Fearing God, wisdom, righteousness, sanctification. It's motivation. We're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope. How? By, by wisdom. Fearing God, seeking His Word, starting our day with His Word, ending his, our day with His Word. Starting our day with prayer, ending our day with prayer, hiding His Word in the heart and living it, wisdom, righteousness, being ambassadors for Jesus Christ, minister of exile. How that's, that's supposed to be a motivation. God can come back any day now. You you can get called home any day now. Even if you set the uh, the day of Christ, the day of redemption, when we get caught up, if you put that aside, you can still get called home any day now. God can say, okay, I want you to come home now. And then once you get called home in death, I always say in life or in death. In life, the catching away, the day of Christ, that blessed hope. Go ahead. Or you can get caught up in death. We can grow old and die. Or I can get hit being in a car accident and God can say, that's what I want because it's time for you to come home. You've done your part. It's time for you to come home. Okay. So we talked about what it means to be in Christ and I've mentioned that these false converts coming to the body of Christ really mess up the brethren. We need to get them out. I said, let's get this, let's get it, let's get them out. We, I've said this in other studies. We need to get the, the, the false brethren out. The false brethren are coming in and they're sowing division. They're getting brethren back under the lust of the flesh. They're getting brethren to conform to the world, love the world, be friends to the world. They're getting them back under worldliness where it's the world's way that's more important than God's way. That philosophy should lead you instead of thus saith the Lord. Man's philosophy, man's wisdom. And they start getting you over to doctrines of devil. But the number one goal is to try to prevent people from getting saved. Truly saved and born again. And then ones that do get saved. Because in the end, they can't prevent anybody from actually getting saved. They can put, they can put stumbling blocks. They can put roadblocks trying to say, don't get saved. Don't get saved. Don't truly get saved. And they attack the true plan of salvation. But at first, they come in and pretend like they're one of us. They're one of us. I'm one of you. Oh yeah, I believe that gospel. And then after they accumulate, you know, the respect of persons and they get a following. The Bible talks about draw away disciples after them. Then they'll say, oh no, 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 it's not, that's not the true gospel. This is the true gospel. And they do a 180 and they turn their back on the true plan of salvation. Now the true plan of salvation, repentance towards God. The body starts out with fearing God. Brothers says Christ, good creatures, and I'm trying to, I'm a Bible study, more of a, a Bible teacher, I'm sorry, Bible teacher than I am a preacher. I'm trying to try out a little preaching here and there. But I'm a Bible stu uh, student. Okay, I study the Word of God and I do Bible studies. Right? 
And we do talk about hell. We do talk about sin. But what gets men to fear God is you preach against sin and you warn people about hell. When they become broken, that's when it's time to repent. And that's why we say the first step is repentance. But sometimes we tend to leave out the fearing God, preaching against sin, warning about hell, and putting the fear of God in them. Remember the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. When someone starts to fear God, they start to fear hell, they start, their attitude towards their sin changes. What is that? It's repentance. The Bible says God is nigh in them, uh, God is, is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such that be of a contrite spirit. The Bible says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Godly sorrow, sorrow towards God. For what? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They've to altogether become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. The wages of sin is death. The law of sin and death. Hell. You sinned against God. You're on your way to hell, and you deserve to go to hell for sinning against God. Lord, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for my sins. That's true biblical repentance. And only through true biblical repentance can you get the second part Believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. A lot of people have head knowledge. A lot of people have head knowledge. They know what Jesus Christ did. They know why he did it. But he's not here. How we know it's supposed to be here when we get to the third step. But the second step is you've got you to learn the story of Jesus Christ. Who he is. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 says how that Christ died for our sins. How he died. He's the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And you start learning that, hey, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. It's in the book of Hebrews. Okay. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. The bloods of bulls and goats can't take your sins away. They could cover them, but they can't take them away. You can't save yourself. But God sacrificed His, own, His only begotten Son. I almost said it the wrong way. Because the Bible versions say only son. That's wrong. Only begotten son. Born of, derived from. God manifest in the flesh. It was the body of God that was crucified on the cross. It was God the Father's blood that was shed on the cross. And only God's blood can wash your sins away. How he died? For our sins. There's your repentance again. You don't just come to him saying, ah, it's not a big deal. No, it is a big deal. He took my place. He went through what I should have gone through and deserved to go through. You learn what He did and you believe that He died for your sins. How He died and for your sins and you come to Him throwing your iniquities at the foot of the cross. Your sins. Here's my sins. I'm a dirty, rotten, filthy, low down, no good sinner on my way to hell and I deserve to go to hell for sinning against God. You throw your wickedness. The old man is dead and buried with Christ. The new man is raised with him. And that's the second part of that belief. You have to believe how he died for our sins, why he died. That he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Why? Because he proved that he's God Almighty. God the Father manifest in the flesh. The Bible talks about Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Bible talks about how God the Father says, I raised him up. Then you talk about in the Bible where it talks about he was put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. The Godhead rose Jesus up because Jesus is the person of God, the image of God, the flesh of God. He's God fully and completely. But how he died, why, how he died for our sins never makes it down here if you skip repentance. And that's the number one thing that is the number one tool of Satan. He takes repentance out of the equation. Oh, repentance just going from unbelief to belief. That's a lie. Repentance is works. That's a lie. You know, he was a liar from the beginning and the father of it. it says you're of your father. When people come around saying that, you're of your father the devil. And the lust of your father you will do. He was a liar from the beginning and the father of it. You to repent and believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You confess both in prayer. 
People keep saying, you keep pointing at the heart. The Bible, time and time again in our studies, brothers and sisters, we come across the heart, the heart, the heart. There's head issues and there's heart issues. Salvation is a heart issue, not a head issue. The okay? Bible says, uh, with, the, with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. Not the head. The heart, man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made to salvation. You confess both your repentance and your belief in prayer to God. Lord, I am a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner on my way to hell, and I deserve to go to hell. Lord, I am so sorry for sinning against you, but I believe in the blood of Jesus Christ that washed my sins away, that His sacrifice on the cross was for me. And it can take my sins away and wash my sins away. That He's God Almighty. That He died and was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, proving that He's God Almighty. You confess both in prayer, your repentance and your belief to God in prayer, and then whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. Only then the whosoever. See, once again, you got these people that profess to be Bible believers and use this book, and then they'll say something like the whosoever clause, the whosoever clause. No, whoever has done those steps, repented, believed, confessed both in prayer, and now whosoever shall call upon his name shall be saved. You have to ask God to save you. Today, the popular thing is they take repentance out, and then they start taking prayer out, so you just take salvation. You don't ask for it. You take it, and when you take something without asking, that's called stealing. Or, if you take something without asking, you're saying, I deserve it. I've earned it. Give me it. Okay? But I wanted to go through that. True, and then after salvation, the Bible says, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And that's what we're going to get into in this study. The changed life. A, someone who professes to be in Christ. A Bible-believing, God-fearing man, a man or woman. A brother or sister in Christ. That they're, they're living a life. Oh, I'm one of you. I'm one of you. Prove it. To these days, we're not doing that. Online, it's next to impossible to get someone to prove it because it's all just words online. That's why we need to get back to face-to-face -face fellowship. We need to get back to house churches. Why? Because that's the only way I believe you're going to truly be able to protect the flock when it comes to us coming together to true, with true fellowship. It's almost next to impossible to have a group fellowship online. The, the serpents and the snakes, the wolves and sheep's clothing can come in just like that. And how can you prove them? They're all talk. You can't see their walk. They might be talk and walk. They might be genuine. I'm not saying all of them are lost. I'm saying because I fellowship with brethren one-on-one. -on -one. But how can you tell? You're supposed, they're supposed to prove themselves. We need to get back to the attitude of prove it. I'm a Christian. Prove it. Do you line up with this book? Which brings us to the first part, the Word of God. All right? Psalms 12, 6. Psalms 12, 6. I'll turn to the first scripture because we got a lot to go through. Psalms 12, 6. You say, at the speed you turn, it will take forever. I, I need to work on being faster at turning. Forgive me, brothers and sisters Christ. Psalms 12, 6. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Some people miss out on the word tried. That's something God does. And this book has been tried. It's been proven. It's been tried. It's been put to the test. This is God's perfect written word, the King James Bible. Okay? Thy word, the word of the Lord is pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth seven times. Psalms 119, 140. Psalms 119, 140. Remember, pause the video, turn, unpause the video. We've got a lot to go through. Psalms 119, 140. Thy word is very pure. What did we just read up there? Thy words are in Psalms 12, 6. Thy words are, of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried. And first of earth, purified seven times. Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth him. 
It's been tried. It's pure. Therefore, we love it. It's been proven. One of the biggest things they always said was, is a, a true test of someone who's truly saved and born again is what's their attitude towards this book. Now, today, brothers and Christ, you've got good words and fair speeches. Someone can grab this book and start putting it up at, 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 with, with their words in such a high level. Yeah, yeah, this book is great. It's, it's God's perfect written word. And then you ask them, you see that thing you're doing in your life? What does God's word say about that? Oh, who are you to judge me? Oh, come on, it's not that. Their attitude changes towards this book. This book is no longer God's perfect written word. This book is no longer the final authority. They are. You can always tell people who are true. That's one of the easiest ways. What's their attitude towards absolute truth? Okay. Lately we've been hitting, not us, but brethren as a whole in ministries, have been hitting things that this isn't in the Bible. So why do you believe it? This isn't in the Bible. Why do you say it that way? It's not in the Bible. Why are you pushing stuff? Why are you saying, thus saith the Lord, when it's not in the scriptures? You're dealing with someone who doesn't love, doesn't believe this book is the uh, perfect, without error, the final authority. And we'll talk about that in another study, about getting indoctrinated to add to and subtract to this book. We all have. That'll be a whole other study that God's had me putting together. But thy word is pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. That's still true today. I love God's word. I start my day with God's word. I end my day with God's word. When someone comes to me and says, hey, brother, that's not in the Bible. We talk about that. That's not in the Bible. I've been corrected before because I've said things that aren't in the Bible when I said, thus saith the Lord. The Bible says. God's holy scriptures say. Okay. Proverbs 35. Proverbs 35. Every word of God is pure. How do we know that? Because it was as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that, are, that put their trust in Him. We're doing a series of studies called, uh, uh, based off of are you acknowledging Him in all His ways. But we started out with trust the Lord with all thy heart. Not head, heart. Trust the Lord with all thy heart and lean not on your own understanding. This tends to get in the way of this. This. What are we supposed to be hiding in our heart? This. What gets in the way of this? Our own understanding. Trust the Lord with all thy heart and lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Okay. Every word of God is pure. He's a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Psalm 66 verse 10. Psalm 66, 10. For thou, O God, hast proven us. There's that pesky proof. Because sometimes they'll be like, oh, God does it. Well, yeah, God does do it. God does prove us. For thou, O God, hast proven us. Thou hast tried us as silver is tried. The more you stay in this book, the more you hide it in your heart, the more God's going to show you, okay, all the wickedness is going to stick out in the world. All the false religions are going to stick out in the world. And you're going to start to see, the more you hide God's word in your heart, the more God's going to say, see that? Something's not right with that person claiming to be one of us. You see that? I think that brother or sister in Christ has fallen away. They need to be corrected. They need to be exhorted, encouraged to turn from that, whatever they're failing. Whether it's lust of the flesh, whether it's covetousness, whether it's idolatry whether they're falling into doctrines of devils. God will show us. He has proven us. Thou hast tried us as silver is tried. And that's what we're going to be talking about. God tries us. He proves us. But are we supposed to do it? Because the big push today is, is don't judge whether someone is saved. Don't judge. We're not supposed to judge. If they say they're saved, they're saved. But is that true? Is that what this says? Or is that what these wolves in sheep's clothing are saying? These false religions with false gospels. Okay. Like I said, we talked about the true plan of salvation. Anybody preaches any other gospel, let them be accursed, Paul says. I say again, if anybody preach any other gospel, let them be accursed. You would have nothing to do with them. So the body of Christ... Okay. This is one of the big verses you'll hear the brethren, Bible-believing brethren say, and they hate it. For, uh, the false converts out there, the wolves in sheep's clothing. 1 John 4, 4, 1. 
Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits where they have gone, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits where they have gone. The Bible says, They that are of God heareth God's words, ye therefore hear them not, because you are not of God. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. The Bible talks about the spirit of the world. Here in John, he talks about that antichrist spirit that's even now in the world today. So you got this, the spirit of the world, you have an antichrist spirit, and you have that woman Jezebel. You sometimes slip up and say the Jezebel spirit, but it doesn't say it's a spirit. It just says you suffer that woman Jezebel in Revelation. You suffer that woman Jezebel. There's this Jezebel movement what the world calls it feminism, where these women, you know, I, I believe it's a spirit, where they start act, they get talked into take, leaving the boundaries God set for them and start going into the boundaries God set for men. And you see that in the world today, hardcore. But it says, believe it, beloved, believe not our spirit, but try the spirits. Remember? T prove, proven, proved, tried, and tested. Tried, but try the spirits. We're to test whether they are of God. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 12. Here's the one they, they really complain about and they try to use philosophy and, and good words and fair speeches to deceive the hearts of the simple. I'll show you how. 1 Corinthians 2 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. For we've not received, for we, for we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. The Holy Spirit comes in, guides us into all truth. That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth. What gets in the way of trusting the Lord with all your heart? Or thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee? Sanctify through thy truth, thy word is truth. God's word is hidden in our heart. What stops us from trusting God with all our heart? Lean not on your own understanding. Not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man, who's the natural man? Someone who's lost. Romans chapter 8 talks about someone who's saved, they're spiritually minded, walking after the Spirit. The natural man is someone who's lost, is they're carnally minded, walking after the flesh. And one of their big push today, especially in these battle buildings, because they're full of lost people, false converts, is they got to try to change that verse and try to make it out where, oh no, it's just two types of Christians. No, it isn't. It's saved versus lost. We've taught this many times in many studies. But the natural man, what's the natural man's state? He's carnally minded, walking after the flesh. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. And whom the lowercase g God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine unto them. Another thing is, why it's foolishness to them, is this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Neither cometh they to the light, lest their deeds should be reproved. Why do you think they take repentance out of salvation? They love their sin. They love their worldliness, their covetousness, their idolatry. They're just looking for a free pass into heaven. They're looking for that back door into heaven. They don't, want to go, they don't want to come to God broken. They don't want to have sorrow for their sin because they're not sorry for their sin. It's foolishness unto them. Neither can they know, can he know them. Because they are spiritually discerned. Now here's one of the biggest deceptions this day. I'm going to call, call it out. You can get deceived, brother, because brothers and sisters Christ, because you can have people come and they can parrot. We've talked about this time and time again. PWC, you can have someone come and parrot what a godly man said. I can put out a good teaching, a Bible, a Bible teaching, preaching absolute truth. I have the Holy Spirit in me. Someone can come along and hear that, and they can parrot what I said. And it makes it look like, ooh, the Holy Spirit's in them, and oh, they're, they're saved too. 
but they're just parroting what other people said. I've been deceived before by people. They parroted what P they parroted PWC, Polly Wanna Cracker. They just c repeated what Peter Ruckman said. Because it's up here. It's not down here. They just repeat what Peter Ruckman said. They repeat what Brian Denlinger said. They repeat what 33rd Book said. They repeat what David Daniels said. They repeat what Philip Newton said. They repeat what uh, Sam Gibbs says. They repeat of whoever the, the man of God that's truly saved, born again, has the Holy Spirit in. They're up there preaching. They can hear their preaching and they can copy and try to counterfeit it. But sooner or later, verse 15, but he that is spiritual judgeth all things. They hate that word, all things. They try to do away with that. They try to pretend like that's not really what the scripture says. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Yet he himself is judged of no man. What does that mean? But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Yet he's not judged, but he's judged of no man. What's the man there? The natural man. Man's wisdom. The world's wisdom. We can still be judged by other brethren to have the Holy Spirit. He that is spiritual judgeth all things. Judgment must first begin here then the brethren, then the lost world, to lead them to Christ. You have to, you judge them. You're, you're a sinner on your way to hell, and you deserve to go to hell for sinning against God. That's judgment. You want to see him get saved. But some people take this out saying, well, I'm not allowed to be judged. Yes, you are. It's saying, yet he himself is judged to no man. You go back, it's talking about the natural man. The natural man has no right to judge me. The lost person has no right to judge me. The people that are in the world and of the world, carnally minded, walking after the flesh, the spirit of the world, the Antichrist spirit, that woman Jezebel, has no right to judge me. They have no authority to judge me. But a man that is spiritual, that has the Holy Spirit in them, has God's perfect written word in their heart, they have every right to judge me. Every right to judge me. They judge of all things, not some things, not certain things, all things. It's to, it's to, basically, this is talking about the judgment versus the lost world trying to judge you versus a brother and sister in Christ judging. Okay. Yet he himself is judged of no man. Verse 16, for who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him. I'm going to say this multiple times probably, but the Bible says in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. Okay. That peradventure they be, uh, what's the word? Rescued. I don't think it's rescued, but it's um, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Peradventure they be recovered out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. And meekness, instructing those. When we instruct, we do it in meekness. Not out of anger, not out of bitterness that turns to hate. Not, definitely not out of hate. You're not supposed to hate your brother, says Christ. And we're not supposed to hate the lost world. We're to hate the evil and wickedness of the world. But we're supposed to love the lost world by preaching the truth to them. The gospel of the, that can save them. The true plan of salvation. We don't give them what they want. We don't water down the gospel to give them what they want and try to get the numbers up in these battle buildings. We're going to, oh, we saved so many people today. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. You watered down the gospel. You're creating false converts. But it says, For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. Is this what you're hiding in your heart? Are you living it? Remember what, what Jesus said. He said, I don't ignore what Jesus said, but he said, people think, well, you're just a Paulinian. No. Paul said, Be fathers of me as I am of Christ. If you're following Paul, you're following Christ. A lot of brethren misuse that verse. They mean we can just skip Paul and go straight to Jesus Christ and the Gospels. Primarily, Jesus and the Gospels is preaching the kingdom of gospel of the kingdom of heaven. It's not for us today. But there was times where Jesus still gave us a lot of instruction and righteousness all through the, through the Gospels. And there's times where Jesus did prophesy that he gave us the title for this time period, the time of the Gentiles, until the time of the Gentiles be come in. There's times where he prophesied this dispensation, the time of the Gentiles. But Paul says, be ye followers of me as I am of Christ. What's he saying? If you're following him, you're following Christ. If you skip him, you're not following Christ. 
Paul, in every apostle uh, letter that he writes in uh, the epistles, he says, I'm an apostle ordained by Jesus Christ. Sorry to go off on this tangent a little bit, but people are starting to forget that. These false converts, they love to go to the Gospels for salvation, but they hate, they call it the Romans road to hell. They hate the Pauline epistles when Paul says, here's the Gospel that's revealed to me to the Gentiles, for the time of the Gentiles, for everybody, but for the time of the Gentiles, for the, the period time period that we're in right now. They hate that. They'd rather go to the Gospels. But those Gospels are not the, made primarily the Gospel of the Kingdom of Heaven, and that's not for today. The Gospel that's for us is the Gospel that's revealed to Paul. But they keep saying, Romans road to hell. Sorry to go off that tangent a little bit. But Jesus Christ said himself, Blessed is they that hear the Word of God and keep it. You hide this in your heart. What does it mean to hide this in your heart? You're living it. If you're not living it, all you've got is head knowledge. Some people have head knowledge, brothers of Christ, and they can quote scripture. But when we say, we're going to get into this, when we say prove it, it's the life that they're living. Does the life that they live line up with this book? Are they giving in to covetousness, idolatry? Are they loving the world more than they claim to love God? Remember the Bible talks about lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God? Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. What's the power? The changed life. The power of the gospel is when God saves you, you are set apart from this wicked world. And we went through all that. Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. You're set apart from this world. That's the power of the gospel. They deny the power of the gospel. Oh, there doesn't have to be a changed life. You're dealing with someone who's lost. Brothers, says Christ, I've listened to some amazing testimonies from brethren. And the, real, the, the ones that I believe are real, I've, I've listened to some false ones too. I just believed and I'm saved. That's, not a t that, that's a false testimony. The true testimony is when brethren talk about how lost they were, how wicked they were, how evil they were, how they were on their way to hell and deserved to go to hell. And they came to God broken. Repentance towards God, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. And now that God has saved me, that man no longer exists. I'm a new man. I'm a new creature. God cleaned up my life. I don't know how he did it, but he did it. He got this sin out of my life. He got me going in the right direction. He got me in the right book. He got me living right. He got me talking right. He changes the way I think about everything. That's why it says, Behold, all things have become new. All things. And you got people that their testimony says, I believed. Yeah, I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. Yeah. And I believed. And I'm saying, that's their test. That's, that's not someone who's saved. When people say, when I think back of my lost life and how, how much I was lied to, how much I was deceived, how most of the people I hung out with that had a profession of faith, how they were lost, just like I was. But mainly, I was so frustrated on how much I was lied to. I learned more in the first year of truly getting saved the Bible way, God's way. Through, I learned the Bible version issue. And then I, I learned the gospel, but it was up here. I learned the Bible version issue. And then I had to come to a point where this is God's perfect written word. This is absolute truth. And if this is absolute truth, that gospel that I heard that was up here, i got to follow it. And it starts hitting you, and it makes its way down here. They say you miss heaven by 13 inches. It's up here, but it never makes it down here. Why? Repentance. It came to the point where I became broken. And I fell on my knees and said, Lord, I was never taught this. I was never shown this truth. Lord, I'm on my way to hell. I'm not a Christian. I've been calling myself Christian my whole life. I'm not a Christian. I'm not in Christ. I'm lost. I'm on my way to hell, Lord. Look at the, I, I, the Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games, porn, the lies, the fornication. I'm not saved. I look like the world, act like the world, talk like the world. And then I just have a profession of faith. I came to God broken. When someone gives a true testimony, it's heartfelt, but it shows the change from the lost man to the new man, that God saved me. God put me on the right path. I'm His now. He commands, I obey. Now what about Paul? Did Paul say, oh, no, if they just profess to be saved, they're saved? 
One of the reasons why these battle buildings are pretty much done with, why I tell brethren you want to stay away from the battle buildings, is they've gotten away from proving it. You claim you're saved, prove it. That's one of the things they've gotten away from. Satan's ministers are all through these battle buildings, infecting and infesting these battle buildings. And one of the reasons why it's become so easy is they don't prove it. They don't make people prove themselves. The other thing is they invite, they purposely invite lost people into the fellowship. We're going to get to that verse. Those are the two reasons why these battle buildings are infected and diseased with worldliness, false converts. Did Paul say to prove it? Like I said, this whole study got me started because I was like, how many times did Paul say prove it? And I started looking through it. Turn to Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy sanctification, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Why is it these easy believers, we call them easy believers, but bottom line, they're a false gospel. They're a repentant, it's, we call it easy believism, but what it is is they take repentance out. I want to say repentantless gospel is what it is. It's not easy believing. It's repentantless gospel. It's a gospel that's pleasing to the lost world that doesn't want to repent. That's what it is. Why do they throw the biggest fit when we say there's supposed to be a changed life? Where's the changed life at? I don't see a changed life. I doubt your salvation. How dare you doubt my salvation? which is your reasonable service. It's reasonable to expect that if someone says, I'm saved, born again, they better be set apart from this wicked world, and they better start lining up with this book. It's reasonable. Now, brothers and sisters Christ, we need to have grace for those. When I was first saved, I was still struggling with the flesh. God was working on me. I talk about how I kind of thought God sometimes, but God, I really like this. I really, I'm really addicted to my Hollywood movies, TV shows, and video games. I really like this. Or I really, And God really had to kind of smack me around a few times. I went through some extra hard times I shouldn't have had to go through if I had just submitted myself to the Lord full and completely on day one. It takes time to sanctify. God cleans us up. I'm not saying someone who gets saved, they're false because they're still living. God's got some cleaning to do. But their heartfelt desire, my heartfelt desire through it all, even though I fought God a little a bit, sometimes it feels like a lot on some issues, I wanted God. I wanted things God's way. There's times God showed me something I was like, oh, man, really? Well, I got to give it up. Got to give it up. Why? Because I want to please God and I belong to God. Remember we, uh, in Ecclesiastes? What's... What pleases God when it comes to His creation? We were created for His pleasure. Um, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory. The 24 elders throwing their th th uh, crowns before the throne in Revelation. For Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. What pleases God? If uh, The whole conclusion of Ecclesiastes, the preacher, this is the whole conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. What's the commandment today? Obey the gospel. And after you get saved, there's a changed life, which is your reasonable service. It's reasonable. It, it, it should, it, why is it? Because they're false. I keep going, well, why, is it, why are they throwing the biggest fit? Because they're lost. They don't want to truly get saved and born again. They don't want the changed life. They don't want to be a living sacrifice. They don't want to be holy. They like to talk the talk. Oh yeah, I'm a living sacrifice. Oh yeah, so we need to be holy. They like to talk the talk, but they don't want to walk the walk. When we say prove it, it's the walk that you're supposed to be judging, not the words. Brother says Christ, that's part of the deception also. You just judge the words. They say it, therefore it's true. Their life that they live, their works are what we're supposed to be judging. When it comes to proving, do your works line up with your words? Does the life that you live line up with this book? Are you really one of us? Are you really a Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman, a brother and sister in Christ? Verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove. 
No, 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 I don't have to prove it. You, you can't prove me, and I don't have to prove anything. That ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God, and how you do it through your life, being a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Oh, no, no, we don't. Paul says so. Are you against the Word of God? Well, I'm not. In words, I'm not against the Word of God. But in deeds, their actions, they are against the Word of God. But this is Christ. They're supposed to, we're supposed to prove ourselves. And they're supposed to, we're supposed to prove others around us. First, uh, there's times where I talk about, Lord, am I conforming to this world? Am I being a coward sometimes and caving in and saying, okay, I'll conform a little bit to keep... Or am I standing firm? I judge myself first. Then I look at all these professing Christians out there. I, I, I have a lot of, several people in my neighborhood who are professing Christians. Some are Catholic. All these false religions that like to steal the, the title Christian. Then we have what's supposed to be the Christian you know, faith, that you have a lot of counterfeits of those. But judgment must first begin here, and then you start looking at everybody else and saying, hey, you're not living according to this book. First of all, you can't. everyone I, I know around here that claims to be Christian hates the King James Bible with their works, with their deeds. They'll say, oh, it's a nice translation. However, they hate it. They don't want anything to do with this book. They love their Bible perversions that have an antichrist spirit, that worldly spirit. 2 Corinthians verse eight, or chapter 8, verse 7. 2 Corinthians 8, 7. See that we're supposed to prove ourselves. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. Oh, no, no, you can't. We don't, we don't have to prove ourselves. 2 Corinthians 8, 7. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith, in utterance, and knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of your forwardness of others, and to prove the sincerity of your love. To prove the sincerity of your love. Are you true? Sincerity means true. Is your love true? I want to prove it. This is Paul. I'm going to prove that your love is sincerity. I don't know how many times I've heard today, Brother Jesus Christ, I know you've been through it. I've been hurt by false converts, stabbed in the back. I've been stabbed in the back by brethren. But today, we throw the word love. I love you, brother. I'm here for you, brother. I'm praying for you, brother. We throw it around like a salutation. Just something you say when you see someone say hello when it comes to the brethren. No, it's supposed to be down here. And it's supposed to be proven. My mentor, I love you, brother. I'm here for you. I'm praying for you, brother. And the moment I make Bible studies, kicking his lowercase g gods, he crucifies me. I hate you. You're lost. You're a heretic. You're a, he's a false convert. Stay away from him. He'll mess you up. What happened to, I love you, brother, I'm here for you, brother, I'm praying for you, brother. I've seen that with a lot of people online. What is Paul saying here? I'm going to prove the sincerity of your love. Now, I'm not saying you have to agree with me when I'm wrong. But remember what the Bible says, in meekness instructing those that oppose himself. Our heartfelt desire for a brother in Christ, when we see that they've fallen, when we see they're going the wrong way, or even if I feel like a brother in Christ is, or sister in Christ has wronged me, I still go to them with the, the heartfelt desire to see the, everything get worked out. So that we're of the same mind, the same judgment, striving together, the Bible says. That we're standing together. When you see a brother that's fallen down, you want to see him get back up. You don't want to see him just fall. He's fallen, and then you take some brother, and it's like, you see a brother in Christ that's fallen, so what do you do? Do you go over there? And exhort them through the scriptures to help them back up? No, they grab bats and go over there and start beating the brother in Christ while he's still down. That's not love for your brothers and sister in Christ. We're going to attack him. We're going to call him names. We're going to mock him. We're going to bear false witness. Backbiting and whispering. We're going to, do, we're going to try to play politics and cru, uh, cru, uh, do political... Uh, uh, a political assass uh, character assassination. That's what I'm looking for. Characters. We're going to destroy his character. We're going to make everyone just think he's just the wor most worthless, evil, bad person in the world so nobody will listen to him. He says he's going to prove your sincerity and your love. Where's the love for the brethren today? Where is it? The actions. That's what gets proved. Actions. When I disagree with somebody, is my love still there? 
for that brother or sister in Christ. When I see a brother and sister in Christ in sin, is my love still there for them? Let's say I correct them with the scriptures and they go, oh, I don't care, and they keep walking. I planted a seed, the perfect seed, the Word of God, and I tried to help them. And from that day on, yep, they're on their own. I tried, and I keep praying for them. Lord, open their eyes to what they're becoming. Look and open their eyes for the direction they're going. I pray that for some of the men in ministry. I don't sit here and pray for their destruction. I don't sit here and just show such bitterness and hate towards them. Paul says you've got to prove. He's got to prove the sincerity of your love. He's got to prove it. Is it real? Is it sincere? Is it true? Or are you just saying it? Are they just saying it? 2 Corinthians 13.5 2 Corinthians 13.5 One of the big verses on proof. Examine yourself. That's what communion is all about. Examine yourself whether you be in the faith. That's what communion is about. That's why you eat the bread and drink the grape juice. <laughs> okay. It's because you're going through your life saying, Lord, am I living for you? Is there, is there anything getting in the way of my walk with you? Is there anything getting in the way of the ministry, my usefulness to you in the ministry? Is there anything getting in the way of my fellowship with the brethren and being a servant to the brethren? Is there anything getting in the way of me witnessing for you? The ministry of reconciliation. Examine yourself whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. We're supposed to prove that we're in the faith? Oh, no, no, no. You just say you're saved and you're saved. You just say you're one of us, and you're one of us. No, prove it. I'm going to examine myself, and I have, and I keep doing it every day, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. I've proven myself, and I still prove myself. There's still sometimes I fail. There's sometimes I, I, I fall flat on my face. I make mistakes. I fall on my knees in repentance. I forsake that error. And I get back to my walk with the Lord. Remember what Jesus said? If any man come after me, he must deny himself, repentance, take up his cross daily, get that sin out of your life, or get that error, that mistake you made out of your life, and get back to your walk with the Lord. You still can make mistakes. But what's the proving? Your actions. Remember we talked about Aaron. We've done some studies lately on Aaron. Aaron, he made some big mistakes, but in the end, he turned back to God and did what was right by God. He proved that he was one of that he belonged to God. He made mistakes. He made some big mistakes. King David, same thing. He made some big mistakes, but he proved that God was what was matters in the end. He proved that God's what matters. That he belongs to God. He's a man after God's own heart. The Bible says. You're still to prove yourself. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. You know what reprobates is? The Bible uses false, says false converts, but reprobate means worthless. You're not saved. You're worthless. You're on your way to hell, and you deserve to go to hell for sinning against God. You need to get saved. You have a profession of faith, but you're a reprobate. You need to get saved and born again. Verse 6. But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. Why did Paul say that? Could it be that he proved himself to not be a reprobate? To be true to the Lord? The changed life? He's, he used to haul Christians to jail. He was against Christianity, biblical Christianity. The, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. He was hauling people off to get uh, to jail and oftentimes to be killed. He was there when Stephen was stoned to death. And then he went out there and put his life on the line to preach the gospel after he got saved. He's gotten thrown in prison. Remember when Paul talks about, and we're going to get into that a little bit, but he speaks as a fool and he goes through everything he's ever gone through ever since he turned his life, gave his life to Christ. The changed life, the persecution, the hardship, the love he has for his brothers and sisters in Christ, to preach the truth to them and be there for them. If you read this whole movement, I'm telling you right now, this whole movement of self-isolation, I believe, is a satanic movement. I really do, brothers and Christ. There's times God will isolate you to spend time with him one-on-one. -on -one. There's times where you have to isolate yourself from this wicked world. Absolutely. 
But and, and there's times where Paul was in prison. There's times where Paul was isolated. But when you read his Pauline epistles, at the end of his Pauline epistles, and even John, you know, the disciple whom Jesus loved, when you read his letter and you get to the end of the letter, he's always desiring to be there. I, I, my desire is to see you again and talk to you guys face to face and fellowship. My desire is to see the brethren again. Be careful of men in ministry that their whole desire is to be isolated and they don't want, they don't want to see the brethren. They don't want house churches. They don't want face-to-face -face fellowship. They don't want accountability. Whole other issue. Okay? But he proved himself with the life he's living. He proves and how do you prove yourself? You've got to be around the brethren. You need that face-to-face -face fellowship. One thing that's really hurt, the, the, I've always said the body of Christ is in a bad condition today. And it is. Why? Because we're not proving each other. And the only way to truly prove one another is to be there to see how someone is living. Today, it's just, it's just cool to be an internet Christian. It used to be a battle-building Christian where you just go every Sunday, maybe Wednesday, twice a week, and we call them uh, uh, Sunday Christians. The battle building Christian. You're only Christian when you put on that nice suit and tie and stand there in, in this building. But the rest of the day of the week, you're just you look like the world, you act like the world, and you talk like the world. Guess what? It's even more, it's worse online. I'm pointing at my computer over here. It's worse online. You just an, now you don't even have to go to the battle buildings. You can just be an online Christian. Brother says Christ, if, it, if God opens doors, sometimes God doesn't open doors, but if God opens doors to house church, you better jump on it. Make sure people are proving themselves, and you only invite saved people into your fellowship. But if God opens doors for you to do a house church, you need to jump on it. And say, Lord, thank you, and help us make this happen, and help us do it what's right. Do it the right way, the Bible way. Okay. Galatians 6.4 Galatians 6.4 This is Paul again. But let every man prove his own work. And then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Like I said, these counterfeits, they will copy, they will PWC. And there's nothing, please understand, there's nothing wrong with a brother in Christ taking a study I've done and put out the, and preach the study to brethren. We're all supposed to preach the truth. And that truth is going to be the same truth regardless who's preaching it if we're all the same mind, the same judgment. But I'm talking this here, prove your own work. It's one thing to say it, are they living it? The person that probably first put out the true teaching and, and preached with all his heart, he had to go through experiences and he had to learn to hide it in their heart and he had to learn to live it and now he's preaching it to you. And I've gone through hardship where I've had false converts stab me in the back. I've had brethren that have fallen away and given into the world. Loving the world more and the things of the world more than they love the Lord, more than they love the brethren, more than they love the ministry for men that are get called in ministry. I've had to go through that. I've gone through experiences. And I'm pouring out my heart to you when I'm preaching this to you, but someone else can come along and copy my preaching, but they don't have the work. They've never gone through the experience. They aren't living what we're preaching. I've had brethren turn their back on me because for Hollywood movies, TV shows, and video games, and anime, worldly cartoons, satanic style music, and, and most of those men, I can't say all of them, but most of those men that were turning their back on me for that stuff, they also struggled with porn. For some reason, they used sex to sell everything. The, the Hollywood movies, the TV shows, and the video games, music. The secular style music. All right. They chose the world. Let every man prove his own work. They've proven that the world, the lusts of the flesh, are more important than the Word of God. More important than the ministry. More Because one of them was, in ministry, was, was trying to be in ministry. I think he's still trying to be in ministry. That it was more important than brethren. Your fellowship with the brethren and being a servant to the brethren. I know brethren that have that fallen away, that choose worldliness. They're trying to live their dream life. They're trying to live the life that they want to live, but that's not what God's calling them to do. And then I've come across false converts that they're of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth, heareth them. 
Why? Because their works line up with the world and not with this book. But let every man prove his own work. Turn us to 1 Thessalonians 5.14. Oh no, we don't have to prove anything. I don't have to prove anything. That's what you get from these false converts. And they push that and indoctrinate all their the cult following that's the huge, the number one false gospel in America that's, that's prevalent is this repentantless gospel. There might still be prayer. Sometimes they take prayer out. But it's a repentantless gospel. It's head belief. They call it easy believism. But it's a repentantless gospel. The true biblical repentance. Because someone will say, well, we have repentance. And you ask them, well, what is repentance? Oh, it's just going from unbelief to belief. They don't have repentance. That's a lie. They've got a counterfeit false repentance that's not true biblical repentance to try to hide and say, well, we still have repentance. No, you don't. Repentance is not going from unbelief to belief. Repentance is coming to God broken and having sorrow in your heart for sinning against Him. A broken heart and a contrite spirit. That's true biblical repentance. Having sorrow in your heart for your personal sins that you've sinned against God. You throw your wicked man for the cross. You throw yourself at the cross saying, Lord, this is how wicked I am and I deserve to go to hell for my sins that I've sinned against you. You don't come to him saying, oh, you're a sinner, I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. No, you don't. 1 Thessalonians 5.14 Don't get me wrong, that's truth. That's a fact. You're just stating a fact. But that's not broken. When you're broken, you come to him yourself. Remember that publican and the Pharisee. The Pharisee's like, he never once said, I'm not a sinner. He just said, I'm, I thank God that I'm not like other men are. He's always comparing sin, his sin, with other people's sins. You're a sinner, I'm a sinner, we're all sinners. But what about that publican? Smote upon his breast and said, God be merciful to me, a sinner. He's not comparing his sins to nobody's. He's come to God broken with his sins out in the open. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's how you have to come to Christ. You don't come to Christ like that, you'll never get saved. 1 Thessalonians 5.14 Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient towards all men, all men. For some of the men in ministry that are losing their temper a lot, forgetting to give God the glory and praise God to be counted worthy to suffer for His namesake. They start getting angry and bitter, and it comes out in front of the camera. Be patient towards all men. That's saved and lost. Verse 15, See that none render evil for evil unto any man. Any man. I don't want to go off too much on this because we've got studies on that. You're not supposed to reward evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. And you're heaping coals of fire on their head. Because if they never get saved and born again, their damnation is just. They're going to have to answer for the evil they did to you. And you're getting rewards in heaven for the good that you're doing to them. You're not to reward evil with evil. They mock you, you don't mock them. They call you names, you don't call them names. They backbite and whisper about you behind your back, you don't do it to them. Even if they're a false convert, wolves in sheep's clothing, a service Satan. You still do not lower yourself to their level. We're supposed to be up here. They're down here. And I've seen men of God in ministry, especially here on YouTube, and even in the battle buildings, but mainly on YouTube, they start lowering their standards to be equal with these wolves in sheep's clothing. They bear false witness about you. You can bear false witness about them. No, you can't. No, you can't. You do not reward evil with evil. But brother says Christ, you overcome it with good. But ever follow that which is good. Both among yourselves, brethren, saved, and to all men. See, that all means all. Back up here, we, we learned up here where it says, yeah, but he that is spiritual judgeth, all things. It's all. And they try to try to make that, oh, it doesn't really mean all. Yes, it does. To all men. 16. Rejoice evermore. But this is Christ. I've been stabbed in the back, and I've had the hardest time rejoicing. I've lost a lot of things, uh, people in my life, and things in my life, standing for the Lord, and standing for this book, and the life that I'm living. 
we need to remember that we're supposed to be rejoicing evermore. We're supposed to be giving God glory in all things, giving thanks in all things. 17, pray without ceasing. Talk about that a lot. Your, your prayer life is very important. Not just your Bible reading, studying, and hiding your heart and living it, but your prayer life. In all thy ways, acknowledge Him. How do you acknowledge Him? You pray. Lord, if it be thy will, I'd like to get this done today. Lord, I'd like to do this over here. Lord, what do you think about this? Lord, I need some help in the Scriptures. I don't get this. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give to all men liberally, and abraith not, and it shall be given to him. Let your requests be made known unto God, the Bible says. Pray without ceasing. You need to have a strong prayer life, brother, says Christ. Not a fake prayer life that you're praying. Remember, people love to pray. People always ask me, why don't you pray a lot in your life? Because I believe the Bible teaches that prayer is one-on-one -on -one relationship between you and God. Your prayer life is private between you and the Lord. And I know it's for the time of uh, the time of Jacob's trouble, the day of the Lord, the kingdom of heaven, when he's teaching him how to pray. He says, "Do not, you're not to pray, you're supposed to pray in the closet. You're not supposed to be out there praying so everyone can see you. And that's what you see in these battle buildings, these men that stand up there, and I'm going to start with prayer, and I'm going to end with prayer. They're saying it. Sometimes their heart's in the right place, but I'm a strong believer that prayer is one-on-one -on -one between you and the Lord. The only time, if you look at Jesus' life, the only time he actually prayed in, the, in, in front of somebody is when he broke bread and God gave God thanks for the food. For the most part. That's why they came up to him and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. If he's doing these prayers, every time he sits down to tell a parable, before we tell a parable, for him, let me pray real quick, and then I'm going to pray at the end. They wouldn't have been asking him how to teach us to pray. They would have seen how to pray but he, because he's living by example. But the Bible talks about how he always went off privately to pray. Our prayer life is supposed to be between you and the Lord. Anybody can stand there and put on a big show and, oh, we're going to pray. Everyone bow your heads and everything else. We're going to pray. Now, in the book of Acts, that reminded me, there's times people laid their hands on somebody that was going to go out and be an uh, evangelist, go out to do the work of the Lord. They put their hands on him and pray for him. But never said they prayed out loud, like one person's praying out loud. They all just, they could all have been having their heads bowed, they all have their hands on them, and each one is doing their own prayer to God, one on one, for that man that's going out. Prayer is, is between you and the Lord. Sometimes people are going to see you pray, you know, but predominantly it's just between you and the Lord. Verse 18, and everything give thanks. There we are, thanks in all things. And everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you, the brethren. 19. Quench not the Spirit. How do you quench the Spirit? Uh, uh, grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you are sealed into the day of redemption. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. How do you quench the Holy Spirit? When you doubt your salvation. I had someone hit me up saying... If you, it's normal to doubt your salvation all the time. And if you don't doubt your salvation, something's wrong with you. No, I don't doubt my salvation because I line up with this book. I understand, brother, when you first get saved, you look at your life and say, Lord, how are you going to clean this up? When, when you just start sanctification, because cleaning up your life happens after salvation. When God saves you and you're now you belong to Him, you're His, you're not your own, you're bought with the price. Right? You serve God in your bodies. You're like, you look at this and go, Lord, it's a mess. And as you try to clean it up, sometimes you fight God. Sometimes you can doubt your salvation there at the beginning because you're, God's trying to clean up your life and sometimes you're fighting God. Sometimes you give up something and then you fall, fall into temptation and you choose to fall, get back into it. And you're, and you're like, Lord, I failed you again. And, and there's times where you might be, you, there's times you might doubt your salvation. But at some point, brother, says Christ, you should get to a point where I'm at now, where a lot of the brethren are at right now, where we are secure. Not these false converts, I know I'm going to heaven, I know I'm going to because they're hard-hearted and hard-headed. They, they didn't follow the true plan of salvation. Their life screams, I'm lost. But they'll sit here, I, 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 I found a back door to heaven and I stole salvation, it's mine. I know I'm going to heaven. Not those people. But brothers of Christ, you should sit there and say, Lord, I know where I came from and I know where I am today. I'm not that same man. You saved me. I'm not that same man that I once was. And it's not just in words, it's in deed. I'm not even close to being that same person I once was before God saved me. 
You need to have an assurance of salvation based off proving yourself that you have a changed life. That your life lines up with this book. Your life for Jesus Christ. That you're in Christ Jesus our Lord. That study we did. Amen. Verse 20. Despise not prophesying. Verse 21. Prove all things. Prove all things? Yes, it says all things. I know this might be hard for some of those people, and I'm trying not to be too sarcastic, but all things means all things. Prove all things. Mainly a lot of stuff we just read through there. That's why I read through this whole thing. I could have just gone to verse 21, but you go through and he's talking about you, re you don't render evil for evil. Okay, support the weak. Be patient towards all men. You know, Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. And everything give thanks. Quench not the Spirit. Despise not prophesy. Prove all things. You're to prove yourself. Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Prove all things. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Sanctify you. You're supposed to be separate from this world. You're supposed to be meat for the Master's use. You know, that vessel to honor. Instead of a vessel to dishonor, you're supposed to be a vessel to honor. Vessel met meet for the Master's use. To be used of God. I'd say, Lord, use me as thou seest fit. I'm in your hands, Lord. Thy will be done. Lord, I like this. Lord, I like that. Let your request be made known unto God. But thy will be done. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's some days where I'm like, Lord, it feels like I'm blameless. It feels like I'm doing right. You know, not trying to go off feelings, but I'm looking at my works. I'm looking at the life I'm living. It's like, Lord, we, I seem to be on the right path. Thanks to you, O Lord. It's all to your glory. I owe it all to you, O Lord. I give God all the glory. I give him all the credit. And I look and I go, well, it seems like I'm, I'm being preserved blameless. But there are days that I fail the Lord. And I go, Lord, I am not blameless. I failed you today. I did this when I shouldn't have did this. I said this when I shouldn't have said this. I started thinking this, which is almost every day. Your mind will always try to wander, brother, sister, Christ. I don't know. If you're, if you're truly saved and born again, you know exactly what I'm talking about, where you can be praying, you can be talking to the Lord about the Word, you can be going through a Bible study, and you'll hit a word or something, and your mind starts wandering. All of a sudden, I'll start thinking of a Hollywood movie for a few seconds. Sometimes it goes 30 seconds, which is way too long. And God has taught me that the moment it comes in, throw it back out and get right back to where you left off in, your, in my conversation with the Lord in prayer, reading the Word, or whatever I'm doing, giving God glory, singing a hymn, quoting Scripture, memorizing Scripture, and then living them, memorizing Scripture, and then living them. You quote Scripture to help get those thoughts out. But there's days I'm not blameless. But right now, let's say that this, for this study, I pray God your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blame. Your overall life. We're always going to be struggling with this body of flesh. I am not sinlessly perfect. I'm a saved sinner. Not a, not a saved. I'm a saved sinner. I still sin. I still fail the Lord from time to time. But your life should get to a point, brother, says Christ, that your overall classification of your walk with the Lord, you're pretty much overall blameless. You are staying in this book. You are listening to it. You are hiding in your heart. You are living it. You're staying in prayer. You're there for the brethren, and so on and so on and so on. Everything that we talked about, staying from all appearance of evil. You should get to a point in your walk. It might take, you might get it done in two years, the first two years of salvation. It might be five years. It might be ten years. But you should get to a point where overall classification is blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, looking for that blessed hope. I've told you this before, Brothers Christ. There's days where if God came back, I don't think He would have been proud of me. Not proud. Uh, I, you know, He would look at me and say, Well done, thou good and faithful one. There's days where He'd look at me and go, I'm just disappointed in you that I came back and found you as, I, as, as you are and not as you should be. Then there's days where I was like, If God came today, I'll say today, He'd say, Well done, thou good and faithful one. We, that's a struggle that we're always supposed to strive true th uh, for, and we need to keep proving ourselves, judging ourselves, improving ourselves. 
but we're also supposed to prove others. Right? These are a list of commands, and yes, all means all. Prove all things. Paul warned the false. That, that, that's Paul saying you need to prove, you need to prove, you need to prove yourself, you need to prove yourself. Now Paul warned the false brethren and reprobates. Now he's getting to, now you need to prove people who claim to be one of us. You're supposed to prove yourself. Now you need to prove those who claim to be one of us. 2 Corinthians 11, 26. 2 Corinthians 11, 26. Here's what he's talking about, you know, the things he's, he's speaking as a fool, and he's not trying to brag like, hey, look at me. He's speaking like a fool because you've got people out there bragging and, and, and holding themselves so high up. And Paul and the Bible says to not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. And there's men here on YouTube, and I keep saying, Lord, am I doing it? Am I starting to be puffed up? Am I starting to think more highly of myself than I ought to think? Am I above accountability? Am I above correction? Am I above your word? Am I messing with your word? Paul said here saying, In journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, the Jews, in perils by the heathen, the flat out lost. You know, just they want nothing to do with Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, somebody, the blacksmith, he talked about some guy, I forgot the name, but the blacksmith who really resisted us. Right? Because he's making uh, statues to Princess Diana. Diana of the Ephesians. Diana of the Ephesians. He's a heathen. And perils among heathen. And perils in the city. And perils in the wilderness. Wait, wait. And perils in the city? And perils in the... No, no. We're supposed to isolate ourselves. And we're supposed to go live out in the boonies. And we're supposed to flee the cities. They're just too dangerous. Now, don't get me wrong, Brother Christ. If you if the door closes to preaching the gospel and the city gets really bad, by all means, go to another city. Brush the dust off your feet and move on to the next city. But the point I'm making here is this whole movement where they're trying to push self-isolation. No, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness. There's a time to be out in the wilderness, and there's a time to be in the city. Okay. And perils in the sea. Time to, Paul was on a boat, if you learned this, that what Paul went through on the boat. And here it is, in perils among false brethren. Now for Paul to make that statement that he was in perils among false brethren, he had to prove people claiming to be one of him. Oh, I'm one of you. I'm a brother in Christ. He had to prove them, and they proven themselves to be reprobate, we read earlier. False. He had to judge them. To say that they're false converts, he had to judge them. And this whole big push, oh no, we don't judge. We don't judge. You're dealing with the satanic false religion when they say we don't judge. Be careful about that. They always try to run back to that verse, do not judge lest you be judged. And I don't, I'm not even saying it right. I'm saying it the way I used to say it when I was lost. There's another verse i got to get married, uh, memorized. But you've got to read the whole context. Yes, you can judge, but it's talking about hypocritical judgment. Okay, and then they start going in the moat in one eye and the beam in the other, uh, and they forget it's talking about hypocritical judgment. We are to judge, but we're to judge righteous judgment. He that is spiritual judgeth all things. Spiritual, we're supposed to judge righteously. When you're not judging righteously, you have no right to judge. When you're lost, you have no right to judge.